So uh, thank you very much for having me here uh, today at the York Circle. Uh, when I first met Lauren Marsden for this uh, presentation, the first question that she asked me was, what's happening in Quebec? So, uh, and she seemed uh, quite interested in the answer, or at least in an answer. So I stayed with this question in mind, and my presentation will try to provide you some insights into this fairly broad uh, question. But uh, don't expect sophisticated predictions about the future. Uh, political scientists have never been very good at, at that. So instead, I will, broad, um, I will draw a broad picture of the situation, and, uh, uh, and I will finish with some uh, more with some questions. So uh, more precisely, so my presentation will proceed in three steps. So the first step will be to, uh, to document the, the current uh, situation. So I'll do this by uh, firstly uh, presenting to you the main uh, political parties in Quebec, uh, which will set the stage for the discussion that will follow. And then I will document the, the dimension in the subtitle, so cynicism and volatility, through uh, voting intentions and approval uh, ratings. And then in the second step, we'll go back into the history, uh, recent history, to, uh, to try to see if we can make sense of the current situation through an historical uh, perspective. And to do so, I will uh, introduce you um, a concept uh, from political science, which is called political realignment. So this concept tries to capture how fundamental and lasting changes can occur in a partisan system. A partisan system simply means the organization of political parties and their main constituencies in a jurisdiction. And then through this conceptual map, we will look at the election from 1944 until 2008 and try to see if uh, we can make sense of the current situation. And then I will uh, finish with a very broad question, what's next, with a question mark, of course, because uh, what you'll be able to see is that right now it's virtually impossible to predict what will happen in, uh, in the future. So uh, let's begin by presenting the main uh, political parties in Quebec. So we have first uh, the Parti libéral uh, du Québec with uh, Jean Charest, who is uh, the leader of the Parti libéral du Québec since 19. Uh, uh, 98 and is the Prime Minister of Quebec since uh, 2003 and he is a former uh, conservative uh, at the federal level so he's been uh, the environment minister and he's been also the leader uh, of the party before moving to uh, Quebec politics. Uh, and the Parti libéral of course is a f federalist party in Quebec so it doesn't promote the sovereignty of Quebec, it's a federalist party. Then we have the Parti Québécois with Pauline Marois. Um, Madame Marois uh, is a leader of the Parti Québécois since 2007, and, but she's with the PQ, the Parti Québécois, since uh, 1981. So she, she's been around for uh, almost 30 years. And of course, she's a former uh, important minister and she held some important portfolios uh, including finance, health, education, and uh, family. And of course, the Parti Québécois, as you all know, is the sovereignist party in Quebec. Then we have the Coalition Avenir Québec uh, with François Legault. So uh, this is a newly formed party in November 2011, uh, which is the result of a, a merge with the Action Démocratique uh, du Québec in December 2011. Uh, François Legault is, of course, a former colleague of Pauline Marois of the Parti Québécois, in which uh, he held also important portfolios like finance, education, and, and health. So the Coalition Avenir Québec, uh, his position on the constitutional debate is that is, uh, they say that they won't address the, the constitutional debate for at least 10 years. So they say that Quebec has a lot of uh, tasks to accomplish instead of talking again and again and again of the famous question nationale. So uh, he proposes to not to, to, to address this question for at least the next 10 years in order to put some order in public finance and uh, trying to reduce the debt. 
And then uh, we have on the left side the uh, Parti Québec solidaire uh, with uh, its only MP, uh, members of parliament and the National Assembly, the, uh, Dr. Amir Kadzir, uh, which uh, co-founded uh, Québec solidaire in 2006 with Françoise David. Uh, so it's the leftist party uh, in Quebec of the political spectrum, so it's part of uh, what, can, what can be called a global social justice movement. So uh, this party defines itself as ecologist, feminist, and um, alter mondialist, so anti-globalization. And then we have finally the Parti vert du Québec, which is, which is a marginal party, in fact. Uh, with Claude Sabourin, who is there since uh, the fall of 2000, uh, 2010. Here. So these are the main, uh, the main uh, political parties that, uh, uh, that are present in, uh, in Quebec. So now I will define the current situation. So uh, as I said in the uh, as I wrote in the subtitle, so the first major dimension of Quebec politics right now is volatility. So there's a wide variation in voting intentions. Uh, as Lorna told, uh, told us this morning, it's always moving from day to day. So it's very surprising though. Uh, so uh, volatility simply means that voters can change from one party to, the on to another in very short period of time. Uh, and, vol and volatility also means that it's very hard to predict what will happen and how voters will react to specific events. Uh, the second dimension is uh, cynicism. And cynicism can be simply defined as the absence of trust. So the cynic uh, fundamentally believe that the people and the group that they represent cannot be trusted even in the absence of evidence pro or con. So he begins by being uh, by distrust and try to be, uh, be persuaded to the opposite view. So uh, I will show you some figures to show you how uh, the cynicism is, is, uh, is particularly acute in Quebec uh, these days. And finally, la question nationale, which is defined at the political status of Quebec within the Federation. And uh, uh, so it's very important to address this uh, this question because it has been the main political issue around which the political competition has been organized in Quebec since the 1970s. So we had on the one side the Parti Québécois, the Sovereignist Parti Québécois, and on the other side the Federalist Parti Libéral du Québec. And, uh, uh, and the political competition has been organized around this, uh, this spectrum uh, to the point that it's, it's sometimes very hard to see a real, differences, a real difference between public policies in these two parties. They both are around the center, maybe the PQ a bit more on the center left, and the Parti Libéral du Québec a bit more on the center right, but still, their main divide is between sovereignists and federalists. And it's also important to address this question, because if the current situation is a symptom or a uh, present some symptoms of a major shift in partisan system, there has to be a change around this question. So there has to be, uh, voters in Quebec have to be, have, might want parties to address other issues than this question. Otherwise, we, we couldn't talk of a major change in the partisan system. So let's now look at the first, uh, the first, dimension, volatility. So I'll show you two main figures. The first one is voting intention for provincial parties in Quebec over the last year and a half. So uh, this figure speaks for itself. So uh, what we see here is that, of course, there's a lot of changes, right? So uh, the two main... Um, the two main highlight of this figure is the movement of the Parti Québécois, the PQ in blue, huh? 
which, uh, which here we see a sharp decrease from uh, April, uh, April 11 until uh, December 11. So the PQ uh, uh, reached its, its peak at 40% in April 11 and reached its lowest point in 80% in, 80 in December 11. So it's a variation of, uh, of 22% in eight months. So that's quite a variation. And, uh, uh, and on the other side, there is the, uh, the Coalition Avenir Québec, so the, the, new, uh, the new party, uh, which was created uh, in, uh, in uh, November 2011, so it's why we don't have uh, a line before. And, uh, uh, and, and again, it's the result of the merge with Action Démocratique du Québec, so uh, it's why it's, not, uh, it's already as high as that. And, and the Coalition Avenir Québec, so at its uh, highest point in December 11 with 39%, and its uh, lowest point in March uh, 2012 at 24%, again, uh, uh, an important variation within a very short period of time. And what we see here is that the Parti Libéral is kind of maintaining itself in the, uh, in the middle of this, um, uh, of this competition. Uh, what is very interesting to note is the, uh, so this is the crop, so I have to tell you uh, just a little bit about the, the sources. So all the polls that I'm showing you today are from two uh, well-known polling firms in Quebec, Leger Marketing, uh, which conducts uh, polls in, in Quebec on politics and other topics since uh, 1986. And Krupp, another well-known uh, polling firm, who has been created in 1965. So these are old institutions that are well, um, uh, were uh, credible. Uh, but what is interesting here is that the last Krupp poll from April 18 till April 23rd show uh, the last month from March 2012 till April 2012, we, saw, uh, we see here the sharp decrease of the Parti Québécois, who went from uh, 37% to 28%, a loss of seven points in a month, so, uh, which is very uh, unusual, I would say, for uh, this kind of... Uh, so these numbers from March to April would have, been, would have to be confirmed by other uh, sources. So this is the picture for voting intention at the provincial level uh, since the last year and a half. And the picture is even more complicated when we look at the voting intention. Oh, and I just wanted to uh, uh, quickly to show you that the, the crop uh, polls have, are confirmed by other sources like the, uh, the 308.com website and also by Legion Marketing who show the same kind of pattern of trends over the same period of time. Uh, now, uh, the voting intentions for federal parties in Quebec, so as we will see, the picture is even more complicated. So again, just before here, from March 2012 till April 2012, it's the last, uh, the last crop poll. Uh, which show that the NDP would have been from 29% to 51%, and that the Bloc Québécois would have been from uh, 38% to 28%. So again, we have to take this very carefully, and this would have to be confirmed in, uh, with other sources, because that looks very, uh, very intriguing, to say the least. Of course, there is the, uh, the Thomas Mulcair effect, the new NDP leader who is from, from Quebec, from Montreal. So of course, we can think that, uh, the, uh, that, the, that the nomination for uh, Thomas Mulcair at the, at the NDP might have had an important effect on the support for the party in Quebec. But uh, can Thomas Mulcair uh, explain the rise from 29 to 51%? that would be kind of surprising. And in the meantime, so we see, uh, we see that the Bloc Québécois is uh, going down again in the, last, uh, in the last month. 
So uh, what is important to note here is the rise of the NDP from uh, February 2011 till the election and the decrease of the Bloc Québécois in the same, uh, in the same uh, period. And then we have, again, a sharp decrease of the NDP after October 2011. And we can think that it's with uh, Nicole Turmel as their leader, so the party was not as, I would say, uh, active maybe that under Jack Layton, so that might explain uh, the decrease in interest in the uh, NDP in Quebec for this period. Uh, and then we saw the rise of the Bloc Québécois side by side with the, uh, with the decrease of the NDP. But again, this March 12 till April 12 is quite unusual. So, uh, and this will have to be confirmed with other, other polls. So uh, uh, for volatility, uh, the Bloc Québécois reached its highest point in February 11 at 42%, and its lowest point in October 11 at 15%, a variation of 27%, which is, again, a major variation. And uh, the NDP reached its highest point at 53% in June 11, and its uh, lowest point in February 11 at 27%. Uh, so again, these are a very sharp variation. So uh, this is what I mean by volatility. So again, it's virtually impossible to predict what will happen. Let's now move to the second dimension. Uh, ah, but again, I just wanted to, uh, you know, to show you that uh, another source confirmed what Krupp has, has shown. But not for the last month that we saw in the, uh, in the, last, in the last poll. Let's move now to uh, uh, cynicism. So uh, to show you that, I use uh, three main figures. Uh, the first figure is the approval ratings for Charest, Jean Charest, and Stephen Harper in Quebec. In Quebec. So what we see, uh, what we see here uh, is that Jean Charest from uh, Crop, if we make an average of uh, the Crop and the Leger marketing, what we have here is an approval rating of his work of about 20%. That means that, uh, and the question goes like, are you very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, or very dissatisfied about the work of uh, the prime minister? So uh, what we see here is that the, uh, the somewhat satisfied and the very satisfied account for about 20% average for the last year and a half. So, uh, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to, uh, to bring you some figures for other leaders because the questions are different and it's very hard to find uh, a comparable data. So for example, there's uh, the Gallup uh, a polling firm in the U.S. Who, uh, who follow the approval rate of the president. But the question is, uh, do you approve the work of the president, yes or no? So it's kind of a bit different. And, uh, and, uh, and for Obama, for example, for the, the same period, it's between 4 and 50 percent, so, uh, which shows the, the clear divide in American politics that is almost half and half, right? So, uh, and uh, uh, there's Nanos Research, who also has what they call the Leadership Index. Uh, so I saw it for uh, Harper and McGinty here in Ontario. And McGinty was close to Charest just before the last election, when the Conservatives were uh, rising in the polls. But apart from the few months prior to the election, the approval rate for uh, McGinty was higher than the one for Charest. So, uh, so they don't have a great confidence in Jean Charest, but they don't also have a great confidence in Stephen Harper also in Quebec. So uh, that's, you know, that's not the only thing about cynicism, but it's an important figure. So uh, Quebecers are not very uh, confident about their leaders. <clears throat> the second figure is more uh, specific to Quebec, and it's the question is, who would be the best leader for Quebec? So here, 
Of course, the winner is none or I don't know, which reached a peak at over 60% in November 2011. So, uh, and we said the beginning uh, from November 11 till December 11, we see, we see that François Legault, so it's a newly formed party, so we, you know, he looks like he will bring some change and all that, so you know, he, he's, uh, he's uh, stronger than the other ones at the beginning. But then you reach, at the end, they're all about 20% as who would be the best leader for Quebec. So it's very hard from this to find uh, who would be the real leader for, uh, for Quebec. Now, the, uh, the last figure for uh, cynicism you might know these front pages of the Maclean's magazine. So uh, we see on the right the Bonhomme Carnaval, which is briefcase uh, full of money, and uh, saying that, uh, that Quebec is the most corrupt province in Canada. And the other one is uh, November 2011, that Montreal is a corrupt, crumbling, mud-ridden, and disgrace uh, city. So uh, of course, uh, these images come from outside Quebec but still that represent a real problem that, uh, that, uh, that the Quebecers have. Uh, in fact, again, uh, the, for the cynic, it's not a question of if there's evidence pro or con, but you distrust people in office, right? So uh, in this case, it's pretty clear that, uh, that this has an important effect on cynicism in Quebec. The problem of the collusion of the, uh, uh, and the corruption in the industry construction uh, is a major issue for uh, confidence for political leaders. That's for, uh, that's for sure. And then uh, Jean Charest uh, decided in November 2011 to finally put in place, uh, to finally put in place uh, <clears throat> a commission of inquiry to try to uh, to show some light on this uh, on this problem, uh, but still, this is an important problem, and I, it seems that Quebecers are uh, pretty tired about this uh, problem. So, this is for uh, cynicism, and now uh, the last figure that I will I want to present to you is the level of support for Quebec sovereignty. So we see that uh, that the voting intentions are going uh, in. Uh, in very different ways, but when we look at, at the support for sovereignty, this might be the more stable figures that we have on, on Quebec politics. So again, there is the, the, the sharp decrease from, from the last month, but uh, other than that, it's fairly stable, between 36 and 44%. So uh, what this means is that the uh, La Question Nationale does not necessarily follow the voting intentions for provincial parties. So this remains a very structuring divide and issue in Quebec, uh, in Quebec politics. So what we learned from this uh, presentation, and, and of course, uh, this presentation was based essentially on polls, and polls are not the truth that's very clear, and we learned it very clearly with Alberta. Uh, we, uh, uh, we thought that the Wild Rose would won the election, and in fact, uh, the Conservative won a majority. So this is not the truth for sure, but it can help us to draw the picture uh, about these uh, dimensions. So uh, let's now make a turn in recent history to see if it can help us to make sense of the current uh, situation. And, uh, and to do so, I will present you a, a concept from uh, political science, which is called uh, political realignment. And, and don't worry, it won't be too complicated. I'll try to use it as a conceptual map uh, to, try to, uh, to try to make sense of the elections between 1944 and uh, 2008, so the last, uh, the last election. So for uh, political re realignment, so this concept tries to make sense of profound and lasting change in a partisan system. 
Again, a partisan system is the organization of political parties and their main constituencies in uh, a, a jurisdiction. And this, uh, this concept tries to differentiate, differentiate, differen differentiate between period of normal politics with all its rapid changes and the moods of voters and the issues and circumstances of the day and more uh, uh, structural changes, so realignments. Uh, so there has to be, uh, there's two main uh, conditions that have to be met for a political realignment to occur. The first one is that there has to be a change in the level and the structure of support for political parties. So uh, a change in the level, it's clear, so voters have to change their way of voting from one party to, the, to another. But the most important is the structure. So the structure means that there are some groups, voting groups, that have to change their voting behaviors. So for example, in Quebec, if the Francophones vote more as a bloc, this is a change in the structure of support. It's not just in the level of support. So, so there has to be voting groups that change their way of voting durably, and not just for one election. And the second condition is that there has to be a major political crisis or a major shift in uh, the political uh, agenda. So um, on the last condition, a realignment can occur if uh, a partisan system cannot integrate or process a new political issue that is important for voters but they're not able to integrate it into the political competition. So uh, another way to say it would be that there's a tension between a static partisan system and a dynamic and changing society. So we have old parties with their old uh, reflexes, I would say, or, or their old ideas, and they face a dynamic society that wants something different. And uh, so this can um, lead to a political realignment. So uh, <clears throat> in short, according to this concept, electoral uh, partisan systems are characterized by a more or less long period of stability, which are punctuated by more or less short periods of change. Of structural change. So uh, let's see what uh, happened in Quebec uh, elections since 1944. So uh, the first period is uh, that we'll show you is a period of normal politics. So uh, what we have here is a competition between a bipartisan system, a competition between the Union Nationale and the Parti libéral uh, du, uh, du Québec. So the first four elections, 44, 48, 52, and 56, were won by Maurice Duplessis' Union Nationale. Uh, and then the two next uh, elections in 60 and 62 were won by uh, Jean Lesage and his équipe du Tonnerre, so uh, one of the founding moment of La Révolution Tranquille in the, in the 60s. So we have uh, Jean Lesage uh, with his liberals that won the next two elections in 1662. Uh, and then we have the last government of Union Nationale with Jean-Jacques Bertrand and Daniel Johnson Père in 1966. So uh, what we see here is that these two parties won an average of 92% of the votes during the period. And more specifically, from 52 to 62, they won 98% of all votes. So it was a bipartisan, very stable system, electoral uh, partisan system. And what is important to note is in the last, the last election in 1966, on the top of the bar, we see that the others are getting uh, more support. And uh, this represents the two main parties, so Le Regroupement pour l'Indépendance Nationale et Le Ralliement National, so the first two sovereignist parties 
on the political landscape in Quebec. So these are the others on the, uh, on the right. So uh, that was the, pre the prelude, the prelude uh, to the importance of the, uh, the sovereignty question. So that leads us to the political realignment of the sequence 1970, 1973, and then 1976. So what we see here is that the, uh, the Union Nationale dropped from 41% to 20% uh, in the election from 1966 to 1970. So it's a drop of more than 20% of the vote. And the newly formed uh, Parti Québécois uh, won 23% of the vote at its first appearance in, a, in, in an election. So uh, this is what we call uh, an, election, uh, an election of rupture. So there is a major change that is occurring right there. And we see that, uh, that the process takes uh, a step further in 73, when the Union Nationale dropped to 5%, and the Parti Québécois went up to 30%. Uh, and then in 1976, uh, the PQ won, is, won its first election as a majority government of its short history. Uh, there's a little upsurge for the Union Nationale at, at uh, 18%, but uh, it, would, it will go to 4% in 81 and then disappear a few years later. So the first, uh, the first two elections were won by the young Robert Bourassa, who was uh, 36 when he was first elected as premier in, uh, as premier in Quebec in 1970. And then we have the... Uh, the first uh, Lévesque, René Lévesque government in 1976. So uh, what happened there is that the Francophones began to, uh, in fact, left the Union Nationale to go for the Parti Québécois. A large voting group, the Francophones, changed their way of voting and went from Union Nationale to Parti Québécois. Uh, so enhance the change in the level and the structure of support for political parties. And then uh, and the second aspect of it, so in terms of uh, political agenda, is that the, uh, the Federalists, the old system composed of Union Nationale and Parti Libéral du Québec, was not able to integrate and to process the rising nationalist sentiment in Quebec and uh, this sentiment has to be carried out by a new political movement, which was, at that time, the Parti Québécois. So uh, that explains, in part, why the Union Nationale disappeared from the political landscape. And of course, there was some problem of a corruption by the, uh, uh, by the Duplessis uh, uh, government, and so the, but the main factor remains that the old system was not able to process and to integrate the rising nationalist sentiment. And then it was replaced by uh, a sovereignist party, the Parti Québécois. So that uh, leads us to another period of normal politics with a competition between uh, the Parti Québécois and the Parti libéral uh, du Québec. Uh, <clears throat> So from 1976 till 2003, uh, there has been a competition around the, uh, the uh, around the constitutional question, in fact, since the, the main issue has been around the constitutional debate between the Sovereignist Parti Québécois and the Federalist Parti uh, libéral, uh, libéral du Québec. So we have in 81 is the second mandate of the Parti Québécois. And then we have uh, two mandates of the uh, Parti libéral du Québec with Robert Bourassa again and uh, Daniel Johnson Fiss. And then we have again two mandates from the Parti Québécois with uh, Jacques Parizeau, Lucien Bouchard, and uh, Bernard Landry. And then in 2003, we have Jean Charest, who is elected for the first, for the first time. So again, here, uh, these two parties 
uh, obtain around 90% of the votes for this period, 90% of the vote for this period, and, uh, but almost, but 98% of the seats in the National Assembly. So that means, again, a, a period of great stability uh, between uh, these, uh, these parties. But again, as we saw in 1966, in 2003, if we look up at the top right of the figure, we see that the others are, again, rising. So uh, that might be a sign for another political realignment. So what happened in, uh, in, in 2007? Uh, we ask ourselves if it was a new political realignment since uh, the Action Démocratique du Québec, right-wing party, uh, was replacing the Parti Québécois as the main vehicle for francophones. So uh, that would have been the same uh, scenario that what we saw in uh, 70, 73, and 76, in the sense that the uh, Action Démocratique du Québec would have replaced the Parti Québécois as the main vehicles for francophones. Uh, but uh, what, we saw, what we see here is that in 2008, the IDQ returned to, the, uh, to, the third, uh, to a third uh, party, and the Parti Québécois regained its, uh, its place at the, uh, in the official opposition. So uh, in 2007, we thought that maybe that the so-called debate on les accommodements raisonnables it could have been this new uh, structuring issue around identity, uh, but you know it seems that this issue is uh, is still important, it's still sensitive, but it cannot structure uh, Quebec politics as La Question Nationale does. Uh, so uh, that was the main the main issue that might have been a sign of political realignment, but this issue. They didn't stick as much as we might have thought at first. So uh, here again, we have our three leaders. So it's Mario Dumont from the uh, Action Démocratique uh, du Québec. So what, where does this uh, leave us for now? What's, what's next? So uh, do we? Uh, can we think of a new, another political realignment will, uh, which uh, would have the effect of, uh, of uh, giving less importance to la question nationale? So uh, can we see a change in the level and the structure of support for political parties, our first condition for a political realignment? Of course, it's too soon to tell. As I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, it's way too volatile to try to see if there is a change in the support, in the level and the structure of support for uh, political parties. Then, uh, what could be this major uh, political crisis or this uh, important shift in the political agenda that could uh, make a political realignment possible? As I said earlier, we thought that the identity issues, a common raisonnable, could have been this new structuring issue. But again, it, it wasn't as important as we thought at, uh, at first. So uh, these issues of culture, language, for example, are sensitive, important. But uh, they, uh, they can be uh, treated, I would say, by a different political parties. So it's not uh, a structuring issue that can really lead to what we can be called a political realignment. So then uh, after, so again, uh, the, uh, the main issue around which the political competition has been organized is the question of sovereignness and federalists. So uh, can it be a new left-right spectrum that could emerge in Quebec and become the new uh, main uh, political divide Again, uh, in 2007, we thought that the uh, Action Démocratique du Québec was on the right on the identity issues, wanted to protect the Quebec identity, but was also on the right uh, in terms of uh, economics. Uh, uh, they wanted to downsize uh, the government. They wanted to abolish 
a lot of public organizations, and uh, they wanted to address the debt and the public finance problem. But again, as we see now with the important uh, mobilization of students, um, uh, for example, so there's still a big resistance for what can be called neoliberal policies in Quebec. So that might be, uh, that would be very surprising that the left-right axis would become the main uh, structuring issue or that, or that there will, that there will be a shift to the right uh, on, this, uh, on this question. And finally, la question nationale. Did la question nationale lost its traction, I would say, or it's uh, uh, in, the, in the Quebec politics? Again, it's very hard to, uh, it's very hard to say if la question nationale uh, is less important than it used to be. Of course, we see with the new uh, Democratic Party, with Thomas Mulcair, what they will do with this question. But again, it would, it, I think it would all depend on the next uh, Quebec election. If the Parti Québécois won the next election, they will have some crisis, and the NDP will be, it will be very hard for the NDP to deal with the Parti Québécois at the provincial level. Uh, so uh, if the Parti Québécois won the next election, uh, that might reproduce uh, the crisis and, and, and again, uh, put forward again the main spectrum again, um, between sovereignists and federalists. If the liberals, which would be very surprising, but if Jean Charest is able to have a fourth mandate, that might uh, uh, make it easier for la question nationale, and maybe that then the, right, the left-right spectrum could be more important because then DP in Quebec uh, might be able to, um, to structure its action and become a more important uh, player. But uh, again, it's virtually impossible to predict, uh, to predict what will happen in the future, so I will leave you with these very general <laughs> questions. Thank you.